Before we get into today's episode, I just want to quickly ask that you subscribe and like if you enjoy my content. It really helps the channel out and it motivates me to make more content. Now back to your regularly scheduled programming. The cursus honorum, despite its significance to Roman history, is not a very well-known concept among the general public. The cursus honorum was essentially the guide that nearly every political aspirant had to follow in Rome. Today I want to give a quick overview of the concept, as it will be fairly important in most episodes of this series. And with that, welcome to the first episode of the Rome and Roman series on this channel. This episode will serve as a guide to some of the terminology used to discuss various positions in Rome, and so I thought it was important to release this episode first, as nearly every Roman we will talk about had something to do with the cursus honorum. I should also note here that throughout the long history of the Roman Kingdom, Republic, and Empire, the offices within the cursus honorum were changed in their duties and requirements. This episode is mostly meant as an overview, and we'll talk about the most widely accepted definition of each office. But it is important to remember that at different points in Roman history, different offices held different responsibilities. The best way to think about the cursus honorum is to think of it like a ladder, with each step being a different political office within whatever incarnation of Rome we are discussing. Some of the offices do change depending on what year we are looking at, but traditionally the list is as follows. Quaestor, Aedile, Praetor, Consul, and Censor. Those five offices were considered the official cursus honorum. However, several other positions also factored into the equation, and these are Governor, Tribune of the Plebs, Princepsis, Senatus, Dictator, and Master of the Horse. These five titles were considered out of the traditional cursus honorum, but still important enough to merit notice. It should also be noted that the cursus honorum was designed for men of senatorial rank. This means that really only those at the top of Roman society had any real shot of being able to follow it. It was extremely rare and extremely impressive for a man below senatorial rank to be able to follow the cursus honorum, and those who were able to received the title novus homo, meaning new man. Today we will discuss the main offices within the cursus honorum, and on Friday we will discuss the offices that were technically outside of it, but still held some sort of merit. The first real step in the political career of nearly every Roman, including those of senatorial rank, was to serve for around a decade in the military. The goal while in the military was to ascend the ranks as fast as possible and prove your worth as a brave and fearless Roman. Most of the time, men who were attempting to follow the cursus honorum would serve in the equites, which was the Roman cavalry force, or they would serve under a general who was a family friend or even a family member. Technically, serving in the military was a mandatory requirement for any potential politician. However, throughout Roman history, this role would be ignored fairly often. After military service, or for those who didn't serve, the first office held would be the office of quaestor. Candidates for the office had to be at least 30 years old. Quaestor is perhaps the position on the cursus honorum that changed the most throughout Roman history. However, in general, this position was actually very similar to what a modern-day accountant would do. A quaestor was responsible for overseeing the treasury or the stockpile of some sort of important resource, such as grain, of the respective area to which they were assigned. Quaestors would also supervise and approve any money that the state would spend. In most cases, quaestors would also be in charge of coordinating the supplies for the armies of their region. This position was mostly administrative, but sometimes, especially if serving in border regions, quaestors would receive command of military forces and that command would override their traditional duties. Quaestors were expected to be totally loyal to their commanding officer or the governor above them. By the time of the empire, this office would slowly disappear as the expanding bureaucracy would take over much of their duties. Quaestors were essentially the main cog of the early bureaucracy of the Roman Republic. Nearly any administrative task that happened in their respective areas would have at least some involvement by the local quaestor. The next office on the cursus honorum was that of Aedile, to hold the office of Aedile, a person had to be 36 years of age. The office of Aedile was actually not required for those who wished to follow the cursus honorum. However, the office did have quite a few benefits for anyone who held it, and it was technically a position on the cursus honorum. Aediles were responsible for maintaining public buildings, including temples, and with overseeing various public festivals and games. This last duty was extremely attractive for Roman men who wished to further their political career, as it gave Roman men the opportunity to increase their name recognition and have their name be synonymous with good parties and games. And really, who wouldn't want that? 
In fact, throughout much of Roman history, there are stories of wealthy aediles using their own funds to throw more elaborate games and festivals, as the better those celebrations are, the better their name would be remembered. So while not necessarily required, the office gave Roman men a great opportunity to increase their name recognition and popularity. The next office was that of Praetor. Men were required to be at least 39 years old in order to become a Praetor, and typically had to have either served as Aedile or Quaestor. A Praetor could, especially in the absence of a consul, take command of garrisons or even armies, and could in times of need act with the same authority of a consul. However, the main function of a Praetor was that of a judge. Praetors were empowered to judge cases of criminal acts and civil cases. This was also the first office on the Cursus Honorum that held true Imperium. Imperium is a loose term used to describe a citizen having power over something. For instance, a praetor might have Imperium over a single province or territory, while a Roman general might have Imperium over a unit of the army. In theory, having Imperium meant that the person had absolute power over whatever area or object they held Imperium over, and their edicts or commands could only be overridden by someone with equal Imperium or more Imperium. Most often, we hear this word used to describe the power of the consuls and dictators, as the imperium of these two offices was the highest in Rome. However, several offices actually held their own imperium, including Praetor. Within the office of Praetor, two specific offices held more prestige and power than others. The first was the Praetor Paraginus. This Praetor had the ability to hold proceedings and trials of foreign citizens. The second was the Praetor Urbanus who was the chief judge of the city of Rome itself. The Praetor Urbanus also had the power to overturn any verdict by other courts, along with the responsibility to serve as judge in any case involving charges against provincial governors. The next office on the Cursus Honorum was that of Consul. A Roman Consul is probably the most famous office on this list, and represents the peak of any political career. It was the highest ranking office in Rome, and thus held the most imperium, in fact, a consul's imperium was essentially limitless. The office of consul was meant to be a successor to that of the king, and thus was entrusted with the same power. The minimum age to serve as consul was 42. The office was so important that the years in which consuls served would be named after them. For example, if we were to look at events in 205 BCE, they would be noted with, in the consulship of Publius Cornelius Scipio Africanus, and Publius Licinius Crassus. The two consuls of each year served together, and could really only rule when in agreement, as one could easily veto the other. They would rotate as chair of the Roman Senate, and both were considered the supreme commanders of the Roman armies, and were expected to lead those armies during wars. They were both the highest judicial power in the Republic, and the only people who could overrule the Praetor Urbanus. Their power was really only checked by the other consul decrees or laws from the Senate themselves, or vetoes from the Tribune of the Plebs. Consuls slowly lost some civil power to other offices such as censor, but throughout the whole of the Republic, they maintained absolute power in the military. Soldiers of the legions would take oaths to be loyal directly to their respective consul, and consuls had the power to do essentially whatever they wanted to with the legions in waging war against Rome's enemies. On the civil side, consuls were able to summon the senate and other assemblies. Consuls also acted as the chief diplomats of the Roman state. In many ways, it is safe to assume that consuls could do just about anything they wanted to. The only real checks on their power was that of their short term, only lasting about a year, the veto of the other consul, and if enough of the senate took issue with their rule. If a consul was able to get the cooperation of their fellow consul and most of the senate, then they could, in theory at least, rule like a king. The last office was that of censor. Now there is some debate among historians on if censor was really included in the cursus honorum, but for our purposes we will consider it as the last office in the list. The office of censor was purely an office of administrative duties, with no military imperium attached. The censors were in charge of conducting the census and breaking the population down into their respective voting blocks. Censors would also be in charge of inducting new members of tribes and classes. Censors were also in charge of maintaining the list of senators. Really, the office was essentially a glorified administrator. However, the census was very important to the function of the Roman Republic, as without it, there would have been no citizens to vote. That is about all for today.
Remember that this is a broad overview, some offices had more duties than those listed, but in general, this is a decent description of most offices. On Friday, we will be back to discuss the offices outside of the Curses Honor Room. I may also in the future make fully dedicated videos for some of these offices, as their importance in Roman history cannot be overstated. However, I just wanted to get an overview so that it would be easier to understand some of these terms when we talk about individual Romans. Well, thanks for watching, and I hope you learned something. If I was wrong about something, call me out in the comments below, like if you liked it, and please consider subscribing. It really helps the channel out. Peace.